Okay, good morning everyone and a special welcome to everyone here, especially to um, the visitors here, to my in-laws, welcome here. Also the Graber family and their uh, daughter and husband, blessing to have you here. So to introduce my subject this morning, I'm going to uh, read two stories to you. And uh, these two stories are taken from a book that was written by, by Mark Woolin. And the title of the book is, It Didn't Start With You. The uh, subtitle is, How Inherited Family Trauma Shapes Who We Are and How to End the Cycle. All right, so a subject that's far above my head, but there's a few concepts I'm going to lift out this morning. And then we're going to transition and spend most of the time how to live with just a, a healthy mindset and how to... Um, to, to find peace in the, in the present. So two stories from this book. I'm going to be reading a few other quotes from it, but it uh, gets a little technical sometimes, but I'll try to uh, go slow, and uh, I think it'll make sense. All right, two stories. When I first met Jesse, he hadn't had a full night's sleep in more than a year. His insomnia was evident in the dark shadows around his eyes, but the blankness of his stare suggested a deeper story. Though only 20, Jesse looked at least 10 years older. He sank onto my sofa as his legs could no longer bear his weight. Jesse explained that he had been a star athlete and a straight A student, but that his persistent insomnia had initiated a downward spiral of depression and despair. As a result, he dropped out of college and had to forfeit the baseball scholarship he had worked so hard to win. He desperately sought help to get his life back on track. Over the past year, he'd been to three doctors, two psychologists, a sleep clinic, and a naturopathic physician. None of them, he related in a monotone, was able to offer any real insight or help. Jesse gazing at the floor as he shared his story, t told me that he was at the end of his rope. When I asked him whether he had any ideas about what might have triggered this insomnia, he shook his head. And children, if you're listening here, uh, do you know what the word insomnia means? Yes, Brett. Can't sleep. Very good. Thank you. All right. So this doctor asked Jesse what triggered the insomnia. And he shook his head. Sleep had always come easily for Jesse. Then one night, just after his 19th birthday, he woke suddenly at 3.30 a.m. He was freezing, shivering, unable to get warm no matter what he tried. Three hours and several blankets later, Jesse was still wide awake. Not only was he cold and tired, he was seized by a strange fear that he had never experienced before. A fear that something awful could happen if he let himself fall back to sleep. If I go to sleep, I'll never wake up. Every time he felt himself drifting off, the fear would jolt him back to wakefulness. The pattern repeated itself the next night and the night after. Soon insomnia became a nightly ordeal. Jesse knew that his fear was irrational yet he felt helpless to put an end to it. I listened closely as Jesse spoke. What stood out to me was one unusual detail. He'd been extremely cold, freezing, he said. Just prior to the first episode, I began to explore this with Jesse, and I asked him if anyone on either side of his family had suffered a trauma that involved being cold or being asleep or being 19. Jesse revealed that his mother had only recently told him about the tragic death of his father's older brother, an uncle whom he had never met. In fact, he never knew he had. Uncle Colin, Uncle Colin was only 19 when he froze to death, checking power lines in a storm just north of Yellowknife in the Northwest Territories of Canada. Tracks in the snow revealed that he had been struggling to hang on. Eventually, he was found face down in a blizzard, 
having lost consciousness from hypothermia, his death was such a tragic loss that the family never spoke his name again. Now, three decades later, Jesse was unconsciously reliving aspects of Colum's tragic death, specifically the terror of letting go into unconsciousness. For Colum, letting go meant death. For Jesse, falling asleep must have felt the same. So that's story one. Story two is about Gretchen. Gretchen told me that she no longer wanted to live. For as long as she could remember, she had struggled with emotions so intense she could barely contain the surges within her body. Gretchen had been admitted several times to a psychiatric hospital where she was diagnosed as bipolar with a severe anxiety disorder. Medications brought her slight relief, but never touched the powerful suicidal urges that lived inside her. As a teenager, she would self-injure by burning herself with the lit end of a cigarette. Now, at 39, Gretchen had had enough. Her depression and anxiety, she said, had prevented her from ever marrying and having children. In a surprisingly matter-of-fact tone of voice, she told me that she was planning to end her life before her next birthday. Listening to Gretchen, I had the strong sense that there must be significant trauma in her family history. In such cases, I find it essential to pay close attention to the words being spoken for clues to the traumatic event that underlie a client's symptoms. When I asked her how she planned to end her life, Gretchen said that she was going to vaporize herself. As incomprehensible as it might sound to most of us, her plan literally was to leap into a vat of molten steel at a mill where her brother worked. My body will incinerate in seconds, she said, staring directly into my eyes, even before it reaches the bottom. I was struck by the lack of emotion as she spoke. Whatever feeling lay beneath appeared to have been bolted from deep inside. At the same time, the words vaporize and incinerate rattled inside me. Having worked with the many children and grandchildren whose families were affected by the Holocaust, I learned to let their words lead me. I wanted Gretchen to tell me more. I asked if anyone in her family was Jewish or had been involved in the Holocaust. Gretchen started to say no, but then she stopped herself and recalled a story about her grandmother. She had been born in the Jewish family in Poland, but converted to Catholicism when she came to the United States in 1946 and married Gretchen's grandfather. Two years earlier, her grandmother's entire family had perished in the ovens at Auschwitz. They had literally been gassed, engulfed in poisonous vapors, and then incinerated. No one in Gretchen's family, no one in Gretchen's immediate family, ever spoke to her grandmother about the war or about the fate of her siblings and parents. Instead, as is often the case with such extreme tra trauma, they avoided the subject entirely. As I explained the connection, Gretchen listened intently. Her eyes widened and color rose in her cheeks. I could tell that what I said was resonating. For the first time, Gretchen had an explanation for her suffering that made sense to her. Now, surprisingly, there are scriptures that also tell us that the effects and choices of the, the fathers do affect the children unto the third and the fourth generation, and even longer. So we'll read that in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 6 through 10. Deuteronomy 5, 6 through 10. I am the Lord your God who brings you from the land of Egypt. Out of the house of bondage, there should be no different gods before you, or before my face. And I'm reading from from the Orthodox Study Bible, so it's the, the Septuagint. So the wording might be a little different than if you're using ESV or KJV. You shall not make for yourselves an image, neither any likeness of anything in heaven above, or in the earth beneath, or in the waters under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, bow down to them nor serve them, because I am the Lord your God, a jealous God, repaying the sins of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands who love me and keep my commandments. While these verses here could be referring strictly to the cause and effect of the father's spiritual condition, 
I suspect that the scripture could be commu communicating more than only a spiritual condition. I expect that it could include the emotional behavior and personality tendencies that we inherit not only from our choices, I'm sorry, that we inherit not only from choices our parents make, but experiences that uh, they experienced as well, and perhaps choices that were forced upon them by, by others. But it should be noted that, that these things, of course, are not only, only harmful. It says here that, that the Lord is visiting the iniquity of the fathers unto the third and fourth generations of those that, that hate me, but showing mercy unto thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. And I don't know if that means thousands of people, if the ripple effect goes out to thousands, or if it goes to thousands of generations. I'm not sure. It doesn't specifically say. But notice that the effect of loving the Lord actually is greater than the effect of, of sin. So, so the fact that, that there are uh, genetically inherited traits um, and also effects from trauma there's also the effects from, from good choices. So I'm going to read another quote now uh, from, from this book. And it's a little bit, uh, this is where it's a little bit technical. The stories were interesting. But uh, this here is just a, a tad technical. But it is interesting, so bear with me as I, as I read it. Uh, Bruce Lipton's work on cellular memory both predates and supports the emerging fields of epigenetics, which is, so this is the, the field of epigenetics, the study of heritable changes in gene function that occur without a change in the sequence of the DNA. So while DNA doesn't change, we inherit that directly. There's still, um, a, the, uh, the function can actually change. So there's uh, changes in gene function that can be um, affected. Originally, it was believed that our genetic inheritance was transmitted only through chromosomal DNA that we received from our parents. Now, with a greater understanding of the human genome, scientists have discovered that chromosomal DNA, the DNA which is responsible for transmitting physical traits such as the color of our hair, eyes, and skin, surprisingly make up less than 2% of our total DNA. The other 98% consists of what is called non-coding DNA and is responsible for many of the emotional, behavioral, and personality traits that we inherit. Scientists used to call this junk DNA, think it was mo thinking it was mostly useless. But they've recently begun to recognize its significance. Interestingly, the percentage of non-coding DNA increases with the complexity of the organism, with humans having the highest percentage. Non-coding DNA is known to be affected by environmental stressors, such as to toxins, and inadequate nutrition, as well as stressful emotions. The affected DNA transmits information that helps us prepare for life out of the womb by ensuring that we have the particular traits we'll need to adapt to our environment. According to Rachel Yehuda, epigenetic changes biologically prepare us to cope with the traumas that our parents experienced. In preparation for similar stressors, stressors, we're born with a specific set of tools to help us survive. On the one hand, this news is good. We're born with an intrinsic skill set, an environmental resilience, as Yehuda calls it, that allows us to adapt to stressful situations. On the other hand, these adaptations can also be detrimental. For example, the children of a parent who early in life lived in a war zone might inherit the impulse to recoil to response to sudden loud noises. Although this instinct would be protective in the event of a bomb threat, such a heightened startle response can keep a person in a highly reactive state even when no danger is present. In such cases, an incong incongruity would exist between the child's Epigen epigenetic preparedness and the actual environment. Such a mismatch could predispose someone to stress disorders and disease later in life. So if this research is, is accurate, 
and we inherit a skill set that helps us survive. We can also inherit a skill set that helps us to survive when there's no danger present. However, that predisposes us uh, to potential stress disorders and disease according to, to the research. And I want to just tell you or read here about some research that was done in mice. Now mice are kind of interesting to do research on because genetically they're about 99% identical to, to humans. So do you ever, do you ever say that, um, you know, I'd like to be a mouse? Wish you could be a mouse in that situation. Well, you're probably more mouse than you realize. It's genetically, you're about 99% there. All right, but the neat thing about mice and studying uh, the genetics of mice is that you can study intergenerational effects in about uh, 12 to 20 weeks. So you get uh, parents, and then children, grandchildren, actually calls them pups, pups, grandpups, and so forth. And you get that in 12 to 20 weeks compared to humans, which you need 20 years to just study a generation and another 20 years to study another generation. So with mice, the effect is, is very quick. All right, so just reading a study about mice. So again, a little bit tactical perhaps, so bear with me. In a study involving the offspring of stressed male mice conducted at Emory University School of Medicine in 2013, researchers discovered that traumatic memories could be passed down to subsequent generations through epigenetic changes that occur in DNA. Mice in one generation were cha trained to fear a cherry blossom-like scent. Each time they were exposed to the smell, they simultaneously received an electric shock. After a while, the shocked mice had a greater amount of cell receptor, smell receptors associated with that particular scent, enabling them to detect it at lower concentrations. They also had enlarged brain areas devoted to those receptors. The most intriguing aspect of the study is what occurred in the next two generations. Both the pups and the grandpups, when exposed to the blossom odor, became jumpy and avoided it, despite never having experienced it before. They also exhibited the same brain changes. The mice appeared to inherit not only a sensitivity to the scent, but also the fear response associated with it. So what does all of this mean? If we are to accept what modern research is saying regarding inherited trauma, and if passages such as Deuteronomy convey more than observable cause and effect, the, the question for us is, how should we respond? And what does this mean for us? The book that I've quoted here, uh, from here, teaches a way to process those traumatic experiences. Actually, first of all, it has a, it has a segment dedicated to identifying trauma responses in ourselves and others, like a way to isolate and actually learn what those, those uh, uh, trauma responses are, and then how to actually process them and lay them to rest so the healing process can begin. And like any author, you have to read with discernment because there's, there's aspects of it that are probably not accurate and uh, perhaps uh, new agey in some, some ways. But I'm gonna skip over that part entirely. We're not gonna talk about diagnosing and, and processing. Rather, going to go right to the final portion is, and that is to spend the rest of the time on what a healed paradigm can look like. Like, what does it mean for us today to live with a, with a healthy frame of mind, to, um, to live at peace and, and with peace, and to have healthy thought processes? First of all, before we, we read how we should respond, think about how we should respond, just think about a couple ways that we should not respond, right? Let's think about the wrong responses. It's just the way I am. You hear that sometimes, right? Just the way I am. Not a healthy response when we have a traumatic stress response or some type of, of antisocial action or response in our lives. Um, it's not a proper response to just say, it's just the way I am. I've been dealt a bad hand there's nothing I can do about it. I'm genetically predisposed to this condition. 
let me normalize my dysfunction. Who am I to have a better life than my ancestors? These are all improper responses. All right, so for a proper response, let's read first of all a biblical passage or passage from the Bible for some biblical context. And what I want to read is Ezekiel 18, Ezekiel chapter 18. It's a long chapter, but I like to read it all because it's, it's quite interesting in, in what it teaches. So again, I'm reading this from the Septuagint, so it'll be a little different in the ESV or the, the King, New King, King James or New King James. All right, Ezekiel chapter 18. Again, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, what is the meaning of this parable among the children of Israel which says, the fathers eat unripe grapes and the children's teeth grind? I think uh, the KJV says, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. But again, what you're seeing here is, is this cause and effect. The fathers are eating sour grapes, turns their faces inside out, and the children are born that way. All right? It's probably uh, an overstatement, but it's, it's, uh, it's playing to this idea of, of uh, intergenerational effects. Son of man, what is the meaning of the parable? Among the children of Israel, it says, the fathers eat unripe grapes and the children's teeth grind. As I live, says the Lord, you shall no longer use this parable in Israel. For all souls are mine, the soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul who sins, he shall die. But the man who is righteous and does judgment and righteousness, which gives a description of a righteous man here, who will not eat in the mountains or lift up his eyes to the inventions of the house of Israel, or defile his neighbor's wife, or who will not approach unto a woman during her menstruation, or oppress any man, but who will restore to the debtor his pledge and commit no robbery, but who will give his bread to the hungry and cover the naked, and who will not lend his money with interest, but will turn his hand from wrongdoing and do righteous judgment between a man and his neighbor and walk in my ordinances and keep my requirements to do them. This man is righteous. He will surely live, says the Lord. But, if he begets a troublesome son, right? Here's the next generation. If he begets a troublesome son who sheds blood, commits sin, does not walk in the ways of his righteous father, but eats on the mountains, defiles his neighbor's wife, oppresses the poor and needy, commits robbery, does not restore a pledge, sets his eyes on the idols, commits lawlessness, exacts interest, and takes unjust gains, this son shall not live, because he did all this lawlessness. He will surely die, and his blood shall be upon himself. If, however, he begets, he begets a son, right? Now we're the grandson. So we, we had the father who was righteous. There was a troublesome son. But now there's a third generation. If, however, he begets a son who sees all the sins his father commits, but fears and does not do according to these things, does not eat on the mountains, nor sets his eyes on the inventions of the house of Israel, nor defiles his neighbor's wife, nor oppresses anyone, nor withholds a pledge, nor commits robbery, but gives his bread to the hungry, covers the naked, and turns his hand from wrongdoing, nor receives interest, nor takes unjust gains, but does righteousness, and walks in my ordinances, this son shall not die for the wrongdoings of his father. He will surely live. As for his father, if he cruelly oppresses and robs his brother and does these contrary things in the midst of my people, he shall die in his wrongdoing. Yet you say, why does the son not bear the wrongdoing of his father? Because the son practiced righteousness, showed mercy, kept all my commandments and did them, Thus he will surely live, but the soul who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the wrongdoing of his father, nor shall the father bear the wrongdoing of his son. The righteousness of a righteous man shall be upon himself, 
and the lawlessness of a lawless man shall be upon himself. But if a lawless man turns from all the lawless deeds that he commits, keeps all my commandments, does righteousness and shows mercy, he will surely live and not die. None of the transgressions that he commits will be remembered. In the righteousness he does, he shall live. Do, do I ever will the death of a lawless man, says the Lord since my will is for him to turn from the evil way and live. But when a righteous man turns from his righteousness and commits a wrongdoing, according to all the lawlessness a lawless man commits, then all the righteousness which all the righteousness he does shall not be remembered. In the transgression he falls into, and in his sins he commits, in these he shall die. Yet you say, the Lord's way is not straight, Hear now, all the house of Israel, is my way not straight? Is your way straight? When the righteous man turns away from his righteousness, commits a transgression, and dies in the transgression he commits, he should die because of it. Again, when a lawless man turns away from the lawlessness he commits, and does judgment and righteousness, then he guards his life, for he turned himself away from all the ungodliness he committed. He will surely live and not die. Yet the house of Israel says, The Lord's way is not right. Is not my way right, O house of Israel? Is not your way wrong? I shall judge you, O house of Israel, each one according to his way, says the Lord. Return and turn away from all your ungodliness, and it shall not be to you as a punishment for wrongdoing. Cast away from yourself and all your ungodliness that you commit against me, and make a new heart and a new spirit for yourselves. For why should you die, O house of Israel? For I do not will the death of the one who dies, says the Lord. So thank you for bearing with me as I read through that long chapter there, but it's impressive how clear God is here that, the, that each person is individually uh, responsible for his own actions. It doesn't mean there's not effects and cause and effect that may affect us and bear some weight on us. But at the end of the day, um, God is putting the personal responsibility for his own actions on the individuals. The other thing that comes through in this uh, passage here is God's heart for people not to perish in sin. That God is not willing, it says here twice, I believe, that God is not willing the death of the lawless man. That God's desire is for, for life and for righteousness. He's He's willing that and making it possible. All right, I'm going to read now about uh, 12 points that I jotted down about, about how to live in this context of being responsible for our own actions in the present time w which we live. It's not conclusive. There could be a lot more. Or it's not inclusive. There, should be, there could be a lot more that you could think of. But these are important to me. I have a scripture verse for some of them. For some, I don't. But I'm just going to, uh, to go through each one. So for a biblical context, based upon what we read there, Ezekiel 18. Though we may be affected by previous generations, we are only accountable for our own actions. So that's point one. We are only accountable for our own actions. Two, we are not accountable for our ancestors' actions. We may be affected in some way, but we are not accountable for their actions. Three, we are ultimately not responsible for our children's choices. Even though we do affect them, we have a bearing, yet we are not responsible for the ultimate choices that, that they make as they come to, to adulthood, adulthood. Four, recognize that in a profound and perhaps mysterious way, Jesus bore our sins and iniquities, and with his stripes we were healed. This comes from Isaiah 53, 4 through 6. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we were healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him 
the iniquity of, of us all. In some profound way, Jesus has made a way for us to receive healing. So we praise him for that. Five, live with gratitude. Gratitude keeps us grounded, content, and in the present. Colossians 3.15, let the peace of God rule in your heart, to which you are called, and be thankful. Other verses like, in everything give thanks. Thanksgiving is a powerful tool that keeps us content and, and grounded. When we're discontent and, and lacking gratitude, we tend to be uneasy and on edge and uh, unsatisfied. So cultivate gratitude. Live with a mindset of gratitude. Six, live in the present. Let the past be the past and let the future be unknown. Because we know who will be with us in the, in the future. So Matthew chapter 6. I'm just going to read a couple of uh, verses there. Matthew 6, 31 to 34. Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows what you need, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So live in the present. Don't live in the past. Don't live in the future. Uh, enjoy and experience today. Seven, forgiveness. Forgiveness opens the doorway to our own forgiveness. In fact, forgiveness is the only way to be forgiven. Jesus was clear on that in Matthew chapter 6, where he said, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors in the Lord's Prayer. And just in case you didn't get it, he immediately follows up the Lord's Prayer with an explanation. He says, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you. So if there is things that have happened to us, maybe our fathers were not fair with us, or maybe there's some, um, some un injustice that we received from someone's hand, Jesus says here to forgive. It's the only way to access forgiveness in your own heart is to first of all to, to, uh, to give it to others. Number seven, talk about our experiences. Don't shy away from the pain of traumatic experiences in our own lives, in our parents' lives, our grandparents' lives. Allow those um, experiences to, to come to light and talk about them. In Joshua 4, you have the picture there of them setting up the stones of memorial that when the, the children would ask, like, what are these stones of memorial? They were to tell the story of them crossing the, the Jordan River. And uh, also the story of, of, uh, of Jacob. We set up the memorial where he, where he had met the, the angel. There's, um, there's value in setting up more memorial that, uh, that helps us process or recognize the things that have happened in our lives. Both those cases I gave were, gave were good things. But being able to, to talk about, I think in talking about the good things, many times we talk about the things that are, are not as good, right? We, talk, we, talk, we tell stories. We talk about the events of the, uh, I'm sure... In the the crossing of the red of the Jordan, there, when they would tell these stories about the crossing of the Jordan, well, well, why did that happen? And why before that? All the way back to Egypt, right? This whole story of both the good and the bad, and it's a way of of uh, of talking about the things that have happened in our lives and in the lives of our of our parents. Number nine, process the family trauma of the past. Allow yourself to feel what they feel. Do not allow yourself to be held, held hostage by those feelings, but embrace the time and the place that God calls you to live in. So many of you here know the story from the Kurtz family history that in 1872, a, dip, a diphtheria epidemic swept through the Juniata Valley in Pennsylvania. And in the, in the Abraham Kurtz family, I believe it was Abraham Kurtz family, um, there had been five children that, that died for various causes and infancy and that type of thing. And there were six surviving children. 
I'm sorry, there was, there was seven surviving children. And when that diphtheria epidemic came through, six of those seven surviving children died. So there was, out of a family of 12, there was one uh, surviving son. And that was my great-great-grandfather, John S. Kurtz. So 1870, 1872, within about a month's time, um, six siblings died from a family from diphtheria. And 13-year-old John S. was the lone survivor. Think about the trauma that that produced in the family, having lost all those siblings in a very, very short period of time. So I've gone there to, to Juniata County, and uh, there's a gravesite on the hillside there, and the, the, the gravestones are set up, the story is there on the graves, uh, gravestone. And I've gone there already, I went uh, several times with my family, I went one time by myself, my, my mom actually lives there, and I've actually spent time, you know, like by that graveside, and actually tried to feel the the trauma, tried to feel the, the pain, tried to feel the loss that actually happened there. So I'm thinking about my, my ancestors gathered around this uh, this open grave where six children are buried and, and John S. they expected him to die as well. And in fact, uh, the doctor, um, he was crying for water, he was burning up from, from fever, and the doctor said, well, give him water, he's going to die anyway. For, for whatever reason in that time, they didn't give diphtheria patients water. It was against protocol. And he said, well, he's going to die anyway. Give him water. Give him water. And it seems like that uh, helped, actually helped him cough the, the diaphragm out, the diphtheria grows in the throat, and he actually actually survived. So, again, that was my, my great-great-grandfather. But don't you think it's possible that there's trauma that lives on uh, subconsciously in the family? It's interesting. It's interesting for me to think about that because... Uh, his son, John S.'s son, which would be my, my great-grandfather, died at 50 years of age. My grandfather died at 54, and my father died at 62. And sometimes when there's traumatic family events, there's a survivor guilt that actually follows the family, where, where people feel like, I have no right to live any longer than what my ancestor did. Because his life was cut short, lives were cut short, um, I don't really have a right to, or I can't really expect any longer life. So I, I personally feel like there, there could be some of that uh, traumatic effect that, that exists through to the third and the fourth generation today. Is it possible to process that? Is it possible to go beyond that? I think so. But I think we need to be <clears throat> able to, to tell the stories and to, to recognize that, that they lived in that time, and they experienced that, and God is with them. Today we're called to this time, and God is with us. And God will help us, you know, overcome whatever situation that we face today. We don't help, have to be held hostage by the trauma, but neither do we have to be, neither should we be proud, but rather uh, thankful for what, uh, what God has given us. Ten, be what is to become. In whatever challenging experiences we live in, let's always ask this question. We're dealing with ourselves and our situations, traumatized people, people facing difficulties. Let's ask this question. How can we bring heaven to earth? Yes, imperfectly, but always with an eye towards what's it mean to bring heaven to this situation? Imperfectly, but yes, a, a foretaste of, of heaven anyway. Jesus taught us to pray, Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Eleven, learn to value other people. I actually only added this one this morning because we had this conversation last night with uh, my father-in-law and my brother-in-law. But learn to, to value others. So, so many times we get so stuck in our own heads. Do you know what I mean by that? We are like so wrapped up in our own thoughts, our own ideas, our own agendas, our own feelings. Somehow life is just all about us sometimes. You ever get caught in those cycles where life is just all about me? Learn to value others. Life is to a degree about us, because it's all we know, right? It's, it's who we are, and we relate to other people. But there has to be a balance where life is about others, and life is about me. 
It's not all about me. Jesus taught us really something about value. I'm just going to read this passage here in Luke uh, 22 and verse 24. Now there was also a dispute among them as to which of them should be considered the greatest. And he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors. But not so among you. On the contrary, he who is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he who governs as he who serves. And Jesus asked a question, for who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves? Who is greater, who sits at the table or the one that serves? It, then Jesus answers his own question. Is it not he who sits at the table? And then Jesus says, yet I am among you as the one who serves. So Jesus just created a value proposition here. He said the one being served is greater than the one serving. But I'm one who serves. So Jesus just valued everyone else greater than himself. So that's the key for us, I think, to being effective in life and being, um, having friends and being able to be uh, maybe socially uh, accepted within a, within a peer group is, is learning to value others. doesn't mean you have to value yourself less. Just value others more. All right, and finally, live in hope. Live in hope. This is different than not living in the present. Live in the present, but live with hope. We do live in a broken world among broken people, and we aren't going to be able to fix everything that's broken. But we do know that God will. So if there's situations that we can't completely fix in this life, it is okay, because ultimately they will be fixed. So live with the hope that God will restore his creation. Scripture tells us there's a, there'll be a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. And, and from Jeremiah um, 38 or 31, depending which text you're using, it says that there's going to be a nation where people will not say, know the Lord, for all shall know me. I think that's the future age. It starts now, but I think there's a, the ultimate uh, new creation. Everyone's going to, to know the Lord. The dwelling place of God will be with man. It also says that the, the leaves of the tree will be for the healing of the nations. It's after the great, great white throne judgment. It's the very last chapters of the Bible. The leaves of the trees are still for the healing of the nations. God has this tremendous heart to heal what is broken. And how he's going to do that, I don't know. But I do know, and I live with hope, that God will ultimately heal everything that is broken. And, and we can live with that that ultimate hope. In closing, what about Jesse and what about Gretchen? Just going to read a paragraph about Jesse and a paragraph about, uh, about Gretchen. Making the connection was a turning point for Jesse. Once he grasped that his insomnia had its origin in an event that had occurred 30 years earlier, he finally had an explanation for his fear of falling asleep. The process of healing could now begin. With tools Jesse learned in our work together, he was able to disentangle himself from the trauma endured by an uncle that he had never met, but whose terror he had unconsciously taken on as his own. Not only did Jesse feel freed from the heavy fog of insomnia, he gained a deeper sense of connection to his family, present and past. So for Gretchen, to help her understand, to help her deepen her understanding, I invited her to imagine standing in her grandmother's shoes represented by a pair of foam rubber footprints that I placed on the carpet in the center of my office. I asked her to imagine feeling what her grandmother might have felt after having lost all of her loved ones. Gretchen reported sensations of overwhelming loss and grief, aloneness and isolation, but she also experienced the profound sense of guilt that many survivors feel, the sense of remaining alive after loved ones have died. 
In order to process trauma, it's also helpful for clients to have a direct experience of the feelings and sensations that have been submerged in their body. When Gretchen was able to access these sens sensations, she realized that her wish to annihilate herself was deeply entwined with her lost family members. She also realized that she had taken on some elements of her grandmother's desire to die. As Gretchen absorbed this understanding, seeing the family story in a new light, her body began to soften, as if something inside her that had been long coiled up could now relax. As with Jessie, Gretchen's recognition that her trauma lay buried in her family's unspoken history was merely the first step in her healing process. An intellectual understanding by itself was rarely enough for a lasting shift to occur. Often the awareness needs to be accompanied by a deeply felt visceral experience. And, and then the book says we'll explore those ways uh, further. But in both these cases, these, these, piece, these people have found a resolution to the things that were traumatizing them in the present from the past. Thank you for listening, and God bless you.